Uh, as Anna mentioned, I'm going to give you an overview of the vegetable systems trial and also some touch base on some of those results that we got to get you information what we have been doing. So uh, as uh, Anna mentioned, I'm director of the vegetable systems trial. Uh, I have set of uh, degrees in science, uh, soil science, uh, horticulture and agronomy. Uh, during my career path, I moved from uh, Michigan State University, University of Florida, Rutgers University in New Jersey, and recently in Rodale Institute. My research focus uh, encompasses uh, production of greenhouse of uh, vegetables and and uh, finding alternatives to methyl bromide for vegetable production across the uh, nation. Also looking into how we can use different cover crops, compost formulations. I worked on compost making to see which one is will be bringing better uh, formulas of uh, components and feedstocks uh, for improving the growth or uh, what we call it weed control uh also we looked at reduced tillage in those uh, production systems also i was the nutrient specialist and water management uh, specialist for nursery crops in uh, rutgers and i have been working on uh, designing uh, and working linking soil health to nutrient density in vegetables and grains and recently i start working on another important crop which is called saffron which is a spice uh, it's called the gold spice and uh, i am now working with a group from vermont looking into saffron so since 2012 i joined rodale institute and for those who do not know where is rodale it is here in Kutztown in Pennsylvania. Rudell Institute has many campuses along the Kutztown campus, which is in the main quarter. We have in Georgia, Iowa, and in uh, California. And now we are having also campus recently within added to here, but is in Washington state, as well as in Italy. So we are increasing and expanding uh, our research centers. So the Rudell Institute is uh, uh, talking and working on uh, organic systems, but the concept of organic farming, as you may know, has developed a long time ago uh, when uh, Sir Albert Howard and Rudolf Steiner and others who believed in using composted manure, crop rotation and cover crops to improve the farming systems. That idea was very uh, common at that time prior and uh, along probably a few years after World War II. Um, during that time, J.I. Rodale, who founded the uh, uh, Rodale Institute, lived during that era of Albert Howard and was in very good communication with him looking into how uh, the different um, practices, management practices, and how the farming would be improved by using the components I just mentioned. And always Jairo Dale said, because after World War II, people became uh, sick and he says, and he was one of the people who was sick. And so he wanted to see like, what is it that we, why we are getting sick? If we are eating good food, then we should be not sick. So it must be that we have not been eating healthy food and that's how we are becoming unhealthy people. And so we know that the food starts in the soil, not at the supermarket. And he kept these questions in his mind and asking all the reasons why and why and why. And so in 1947, he founded Rodale Institute and he wrote on a blackboard that we need to look into how we can prove that healthy soil is equal to healthy people, but we need to put in between the healthy food. So meaning to eat healthy food, we need to start with the soil. 
And so when he established Rodel's Institute, he wanted to be a center where the scientists will address uh, and do by experiments, uh, comparing side by side organic farming and compare it to or non-organic farming. We call it conventional farming and mainly to document and educate farmers on proper ways to protect the environment from pollution, having keep and uh, the soil healthy, keep the food healthy as well as the environment, because when we look into those, we definitely we have healthier people and healthier animals, our livestock. So all that will be become part of the whole environment. But let's look at some of those reasons why we have been becoming unhealthy. And that because during the, and what research has been documenting, we have seen that over the past five, six decades, that people have been more having diets that it is energy rich than a nutrient rich, meaning it has been energy rich and nutrient deficient and filled with toxic synthetic chemicals. Also, we have seen there's a plethora of research that has documented that there are increases in the rate of chronic diseases. And we have seen how our immune system was compromised during COVID-19 uh, in the past two years. So meaning that there's something happened and we need to know what happened and that led us to this problem. And so we look into that to see what could be the reasons. And if we look back prior to um, uh, World War II, we did not use much of those systems. However, after World War II, we have something called the industrial farming, which really encouraged farmers and encouraged farming of using heavy equipment, tractors, big uh, machinery, so frequently to till the soil and, excuse me, and moving from monoculture from uh, diverse cultures to monoculture, make more of the uh, farmers to use chemicals to control pests and diseases and weeds. Excuse me. Diverse um, production, as we all know, that we will depend less on uh, chemicals and also uh, they cannot be in close proximity because each crop would be having a different uh, chemical to be used on. So eliminating the diversity and having more monoculture allowed and encouraged more growers, farmers to spray more and more and more. And so more use of fertilizers over time. And here you could see that between 1965 I'm showing you here between 1965 or 1960 and 1980, you could see that there was an increase in synthetic mineral fertilizer by two times or 2.5 times. And similarly, when we look at the same time, we see there was even more increase about 10 times in herbicide use. That means all those really will contribute to our health. And so the more you till, as you know, that the more of that carbon is released from the soil and over decades, you will have more of the carbon dioxide. It is building in the atmosphere. And we heard several times in the news and in the, in the research documented that the carbon dioxide is becoming higher, more gas emission is there. We have less and less carbon in the soil, which is the backbone of any production in the soil, even for the microorganisms is very important. So tillage led us to degrade the soil led uh, the losses of organic matter. And also sometimes when it is done improperly, it will lead to soil compaction. And also when it rains, it floods in certain areas due to the compaction, infiltration would be very low. And also in addition to that, sometimes whenever there is no rain, you will see that the more you 
till that soil, there is no cover on it, then there would be less of the um, moisture in it, and then it will get drier and drier, in addition to building the pesticides in crops. So, for example, here, you could see that um, it was documented that about 73% uh, of uh, tested 20 fruits and vegetables showing detectable pesticides. For example, if you look in number one on this list, it's strawberries. It's very, very hyper accumulator of pesticides. And then the list here goes about more of the vegetables and more of the uh, um, crops and uh, what you call it, um, leafy vegetables like the lettuce and the tubers like potato and green beans, which are part of the experiment that we are doing here at Rode. So in addition to those issues, there were also breeding programs that we know that people have started changing and optimizing yield and size of the fruit over nutrient density. And that means that the more you have the uh, bigger size of the fruit, you are diluting those nutrients in that fruit. For example, let's see here what Davis et al. and other colleagues uh, really uh, documented. They took between 1950 uh, vegetables and fruits and they compared them again in 1999. And so on this y-axis, you will see it is the ratio of the new over the old, what they found in 1999 over 1950. And on the x-axis, you will see those are minerals, vitamins, and other uh, approximates there. So anything below one is considered deficient. So in those cases, we are looking at protein, calcium, phosphorus, iron, riboflavin and vitamin C much less as we go from 1947 all the way to 1999. So this led us to understand more and more that there are deficient. And if we look how that really impact our health, let's look at calcium, for example. Our recommended daily intake for calcium for an adult is would be either 10, uh, 1,200 milligram per 100 gram, which is, or it is 12 milligram per gram. So in 1950, if we take broccoli, that it is rich in calcium, if you take 100 grams, it will provide you with the amount that you need. So as we go with time, you could see in 2009 that broccoli that we are eating now, it is giving us three times less of what we need in our daily intake of calcium. This means now we have to eat three times the amount to reach if that day we need to eat calcium, that we need to have intake of calcium for that day. This means that we have facts now and we have gaps and we have needs. And so now we know the facts that our soil has become unhealthy. We know that the food is contaminated and the environment, and we know that we are becoming unhealthy people. When I looked at the literature and I saw much plethora of work done on grains, field crops, most of those, they are talking about the soil health, and they are doing that on different indicators of soil health. They are talking about how management practices or cropping systems affecting soil health. And some recently people have started looking about the grains and the field crops, how they are in different cropping systems or practices. But there was nothing related to linking soil health to vegetables, nutrient density, and human health. And so with that, in, 19, in 2016, we established what we call the Vegetable Systems Trial at Rodale Institute. So when I created the idea, it is about having a long-term trial. And this trial sits now on 2.62 acres. 
that it is designed to run indefinitely with a regional, national, and international scope. In that system, we are looking into how we can uh, address the cropping systems, in this case, side-by-side, -side, organic and conventional, and different management practices impact soil health. And we selected five different uh, crops, including potato, which represent a tuber, leafy vegetables uh, represented by lettuce, and fruits that have different uh, growth habits, such as green beans, winter squash, and sweet corn. And so when we are looking at tillage, in this case, we are looking how we uh, compare side-by-side -side intensive tillage using different equipment that really flips the soil upside down or the one that can be used as reduced tillage without tilling the soil and helping the soil by using the cover crop as a mat. So here is another video for you to see how our uh, research in action. So you could see on the left, this is where we uh, moldboard plow, we put the plastic, and this is the one where we are comparing it to a cover crop that it is rolled crimped. You could see here from the top view that we are rolling crimping the cover crop. And for example, in this case, we are doing it on the uh, organic system. And at the same time, you could see we are seeding. Here is a side view where we are rolling crimping. At the same time, we are seeding. So here it shows in the conventional where we already sprayed, definitely we are not rolling in the front, but we have to keep it for balancing the tractor and then uh, seeding into it, uh, into that uh, burned down by glyphosate. So here in my research, uh, I focus on how we can find practices that keep the soil healthy, how we can grow organic crops that are rich in nutrients, and they are still at the same time, all these practices to be environmentally friendly. The main uh, goal of this project, the Vegetable Systems Trial, and in short, we call it VST, is mainly to look into the cropping system and management practices impacting soil health, nutrient density in plants, and also plant health, as well as the environment and all that, how it impacts the human health. Mainly, the expected outcomes needed to be how we can provide to our consumers, to our vegetable growers, to our professional educators and the public at large, scientific-based information, because we need all those to make the proper and the better choices, either in managing their soils, in protecting the environment, and eating healthy food. So let's take a look here about, um, I added here some uh, slides in the coming ones about uh, the deep soil cores that we took in the vegetable systems trial. And those, we took them between zero and 100. And then we, to we took those in all the plots that we have. And so here we are outside uh, sectioning each uh, soil core. And we take zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and deeper 30 to 60, and then 60 to 100. And when we do that, we send them to different labs to assess the physical properties, chemical properties, biological properties, and some of those components, they play a role in being chemical and biological. So we looked at we look at aggregate stability, bulk density in these cores. We look at total carbon, nitrogen, macro, micronutrients. We look at the uh, labile carbon. We call it POXI. Uh, we look at organic matter, a protein in the soil, microbial biomass, community diversity, and functionality. In fact, when we, I say we, because my collaborators from different institutes, 
we work together to address different components of this uh, bigger picture. The soil health indicators. So let's look at some of the data uh, that we got. So when we looked at uh, the cropping systems in the soil organic carbon, you could see that there is no statistical difference between the organic, which is represented by green bar, versus the conventional, but there was a slight increase in the soil organic carbon. When we looked at the management practices, definitely there is no significant difference, but still you could see more of the reduced tillage that provided a little bit more of soil organic carbon. Definitely with time, now we have passed another three years from 2019, and we are looking at the same information because we need to see how those indicators will change over time. Because we need to know the practices and the cropping systems, their impact on anything that we look into the physical properties, chemical properties, and biological properties, and then relate them to the nutrient density in the crops. So let's look at another indicator, and it is the POC C, which is the labile carbon. And the labile carbon is an indicator which considered to be rapid because it builds over the time. It builds up a long-term soil organic matter stabilization, but also it can tell us the resilience of that soil to adverse climate changes. When we uh, look at that, the epoxy, which is the label carbon, is the carbon that is available during the growing season for the microorganism. So let's look at this graph here. So at the bottom, you will see the convention and the organic, and on the y-axis is the label soil carbon, which is the epoxy. The brown bars, these are 2016. When we started, you could see all those are the same, no changes. However, in 2019, you could see that in the organic system, you could see both the reduced tillage and black plastic were much higher than those in the conventional. And so uh, over time, you could see there was an, is a small increase in the conventional, but the increase was much greater in the organic. And that's in 2019. We will see, we compare now in the 2022, which we are still waiting for some of those results to come back. We are going to look into that, how much we are increasing every crop rotation, which is about three years. Here is another poxy uh, value. Let's look at it by depth. As I mentioned that we did section them. And so when we look at the poxy, the available carbon, uh, organic carbon, you could see that it is pretty high in the zero to 10 and 10 to 20 centimeters, but it was pretty low uh, below 20 centimeters. When we look at the score, what does it mean to us? So here is about 1,000, here it is about 900. So between 1,900, you could see we are, with the sigmoid curve, you could see that we are in good shape. It is in the blue region, which is about 99 to 90%, which is really good. However, as we go between 20 to 30, if we look here at about 400 ppm, we are really in the red zone. So what it means that we are going to look even deeper and see how those measurements, they are going to be building up from year to year as well as over a crop rotation. So we are looking not only for three years, which is most of the data that you will see in the literature. It would be like two years, three years, four years, but there is no uh, re literature that really documents that over a long period of time of 10, 20 years, how those um, indicators will change regarding the practices or regarding the cropping systems. So anytime you see beyond 700, you will see that you are in a good zone, but uh, beyond that is below that, I mean, it would be in the red zone. 
Let's look another indicator, soil protein. For example, soil protein is also a rapid soil health indicator for potentially available organic nitrogen. Now, we know that not all soil health indicators are rapid. For example, the uh, organic matter and soil carbon, they are slowly, or um, what we call it, uh, it takes longer to show the changes, but we need to understand which of those can give us some indicators so we can share that with the growers to help them understand how those practices will impact their soil. For example, here, again, we looked at the soil protein in 2016, that's where the soil protein was about 9 grams per kilogram and in the blue bar. And then when we looked again in 2019, it was really interesting to see how in both the black plastic and reduced tillage, after three years of crop rotation, it increased significantly and there was no even increase in the protein in the conventional. This is very important information because when we want to link soil health, we want also to link it to the nutrient health, to the nutrient density, for example, protein or nitrogen. And so we need to see how far we can get increasing that soil protein over 10 years, over 20 years. And so we have a reference line where we started in 2016 and then over years we will see uh, how much the rate of change so let's look at the protein itself so we have seen the protein in the soil let's look at the protein in the crops that we grow we see that in the organic the protein in the sweet corn, which was one of the crops that we assessed, it is much greater than in the conventional. So it's greater in the organic, much and significantly that in the conventional. Again, here I'm going to show you even the amount that we have in the Lehigh potato. Lehigh potato is a variety that is very common in Pennsylvania. And um, we, when we look at the organic versus conventional in 2019, you could see that there are also the protein in the potato is much higher in the organic. And then if I keep the same y-axis and I came and I looked at 2020 and I could see that it increased a little bit in the conventional as well as in the organic. And there was no significant difference at, in 2020. So now what it tells us that we really need to look not only for one year, not only for one cropping system, but we need to look every year to see how the changes in protein in any crop. So this is just an example to share with you, to show you that things may change over time and things may accumulate or not even accumulate that will help you to see how those change. Let's look at the squash, for example. I looked at the squash in 2019, there was no significant difference. But in 2020, when I looked at it, I saw that the organic was much higher in protein, again, in the winter squash, which is represented by the orange bar over here. So that is a really very important information for us. When I looked at the uh, practices, BP means that it is tilled with moldboard plow, intensively putting uh, black plastic. And then we looked at reduced tillage and we looked at reduced tillage, either um, uh, roll crimped or it is burned down in the winter squash. For example, we saw a difference in 2020 where the black plastic showed more protein than the reduced tillage. This doesn't mean that in um, 2021 or 2022 and so forth, it will be the same. But this is an indicator. We want to sh show how that really changes. Uh, 
For example, here, why would be more of the protein and the black plastic? That could be because the when you till the soil, you are exposing the cover crop to be um, available for uh, the microorganism to work on it. And with that, it releases more of the nutrients and part of the protein nutrients is the nitrogen there. And so that could be that the proteins that uh, build up and the amino acids in the winter squash would be higher, but you could see that not much of a significant uh, big amount. It's not like two times or something. But this is also important for us to see which of those systems, which of those practices really impact. Is it really impacting potato or is it really impacting winter squash more or uh, the other crops that we have? We talk about the nutrient density. And so when we talk about the nutrient density crops, meaning that we are looking into how much nutrient it contains over the sugar content. In when we have more nutrient content, mean the crops would be richer in antioxidants, in vitamins, in proteins, in minerals. And also when we consume those nutrient dense food, we are really helping our uh, gut microbiome. So these would be enriched and will be more diverse. And when we have healthy food, healthy diets, we will have healthy people, and especially when it is without toxic chemicals in it. So let's look uh, more in, in depth about what it means in nutrient density. You would see so many people document the nutrient concentration of a crop or a part of the crop that they harvest either the grain or the stock or the leaf or the tuber. However, that by itself is not enough to tell me if it is really giving me the nutrient density in it. Is it really dense or not? But when we are looking at the nutrient density, we need to look at the range of nutrients that really uh, encompass that we say it is telling me this is a nutrient dense or it is deficient, nutrient deficient. When we do that, we look at not only the concentration of that crop that we get from the laboratory, but also we uh, look at a reference daily intake value, like we talked about the broccoli before. And that would be considered as the nutritional quality index. And so let's look at this equation where the sample nutritional value that's where you get from the lab when you send a, a sample to the lab for assessment for any of the nutrients. And then you divide that by the reference daily value that you get that from a table prepared by USDA and it documents all the nutrients, which I will show you in a second. Then you take that uh, numerator uh, and divide it by another uh, denominator that encompasses the sample calorie, caloric value, and that it is in that element or in that crop that you assess, and then by the 2,000 kilocalories, which is the amount that any adult will require. Uh, it could be between 2,000, 2,200, but we try to make it at 2,000, so it would make easier for the calculation. Now. When the NQI is equal or more than one, meaning we have enough and we have a nutrient dense in that particular element that we are assessing or that compound. But when it is less than one, meaning it is not nutrient dense in that component. And so if we look at the reference daily value, here you could see that we need a lot of the potassium, more than phosphorus or calcium. And then when we look at the micronutrients, you see that the iron is needed in higher amounts than manganese or copper. But also zinc is important. We know zinc is very important for immune system. And then if we look at vitamin C and uh, proteins, these are in bigger amounts. 
So let's take one example in this case, and we look at potato. So in the vegetable systems trial, I'm going to show you in 2020 when we uh, got the crop and we assessed the calorie in it and it is 367 calories. And so when we plug that number into that equation of the NQI, so we get here all the elements that we assess from minerals to vitamin B6, vitamin C, proteins, and you could see any number that it is above one, meaning it is a really nutrient dense. And when you come back here and see calcium, calcium is less than one. And so in that case, calcium is deficient in uh, this potato in that here. And so now we are monitoring to see if that's going to continue decreasing or it is continuing to increase over time and whether our system is really improving it. If we look at potassium and magnesium, you could see that the organic was significantly higher than the conventional in potassium and magnesium. And these are very important also for uh, um, the immunity and for um, what you call it, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, growth of the, uh, let's say, what you call it, uh, protection of the body for the, the skin, the bone, and all that, and metabolism of certain enzymes. Now, we look at the practices. We see that there was no significant between them. There are no these letters that we say A and B, but if I look again at calcium, same, it is still low. And that means that, yes, it is really good in every element we assess there. It is nutrient dense except in calcium. And so this information is very important for us. And I am doing this for other crops, but I wanted to share for you here how we go from one step to the other and how we are linking. So as I mentioned earlier, that it is very important to document over time how those cropping systems is really, and the management practices. And when I say organic conventional and reduced tillage versus tilled with plastic, impacting different indicators of soil health, nutrient density, plant health, as well as the environment, and then link all that to human health. Now, I am not really sharing here yet with you about the environmental health, but uh, rest assured, we are looking into now different pesticides in the soil. We are looking into the uh, pesticides, meaning herbicides and fungicides and um, what you call that, uh, insecticides. We are looking that in the soil, and recently we took uh, soil uh, deep soil cores in 2022, and we are assessing in 2019 and 22 uh, the pesticides. We are assessing now enzymes. Uh, we are assessing also uh, in the crop itself these pesticides. So we are collaborating with uh, other. Uh, organization and institutes uh, like the Health Research Institute in Iowa. And so we are looking into how the environment where the crop is growing is impacted because we want to address, even with the OMRI certified pesticides that we are using, we want to make sure that if any is really showing up in the soil at different levels, as well as in the crop, and, several, and also compare those in the organic versus the conventional. And then now we are uh, looking into a bigger scale, more than those nutrients that we are commonly assessing every year in every crop. We are looking now into a broad spectrum of uh, compounds. We are working with uh, labs that can assess at a bigger scale, give us about 200 compounds in the same crop when we send them to see what else we can learn 
from those systems and practices that can impact the availability or their concentration to be higher or lower. As I mentioned, our expected outcomes is to address the information that really can get us to provide science-based information without being biased to our growers, to our consumers, to the educators, to the public at large, so we can improve our health, we can improve our systems, how we can protect our environment. And at the end, so when we want to eat, we need to start not from the food. We need to start from the soil itself. So food is only as healthy as the soil in which it is grown, as Anne Gibson said. And this is our campus at uh, Kutztown. I would like to invite you all and come to our research station there in Kutztown in Pennsylvania. Uh, Rodale Institute is the pioneer in organic agriculture. And we do side-by-side -side, uh, comparison also uh, along the vegetables for grains, different grains. And that has been uh, since probably 1981 that started. It is even longer in uh, duration than the vegetable systems trial. We call it the farming systems trial. And maybe if you can see this uh, picture behind me, it is taken from the farming systems trial. And every year we have uh, field days. It is open all day for all people to come and they will see all our work that we do. And that's usually, put it on your calendar. If you can't make it this year, just try other years. It would be always the third Friday in July, the third Friday in July. In addition to that, we uh, do webinars. There are uh, some of them free, some of them with uh, fee. Uh, we do post our uh, results on as web articles. Feel free to visit our website and look for things. We also have programs where people who wants to have internship, they can come and have hands-on experience. We also have um, what we call, let's say um, some of the people wants to become farmers or they want to learn how to farm. We have a program where we invite uh, farmers, students and veterans to learn how to farm. So they will take a whole year of experience from A to Z, including marketing, business, and everything. So I really invite you all to think about that. And also, if you think you want in the future to do, let's say, master's degree or PhD, and you are looking into a project that it is already running here, so that really helps us to connect. And then you can do certain experiments that on top of what we are doing, and we collaborate on that. And so keep those ideas open in your mind. 